What is up guys, welcome to Barton, my name is Heinrich, and today we're going to start taking our player controller to the next level by using a finite state machine instead of the single script that we've been using so far. Here's a demo of what we're going to be making throughout the next couple of episodes. We're essentially going to rebuild the player from scratch, but we'll reuse a lot of concepts from the previous episodes. Now, before we start building the finite state machine, we need to talk about Unity's new input system. This is not going to be an in-depth tutorial on the new input system, but more so a quick start guide that should contain all the information you need to get started. Okay, let's begin. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do before we start making any changes to our project is make sure we are on a new branch within our Git repository. That way we keep our project safe. We can then go ahead and upgrade our project to 2019.4 if you're not using that yet. And then we should be ready to get started. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is come up to Window, Package Manager, and then install the new input system. Once everything loads, just go ahead and search for input. Click on input system. As you can see, it's currently in version 1.0.0 and just click install. It's gonna give you a warning that is basically asking if you want to change the input system from the old one to the new one. If you click yes, Unity will restart and the old input system will no longer be working for you but we can make it so that both work at the same time if that's what you want. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click yes. This will restart Unity. And there we go, everything should be installed now. So we can go ahead and close out of the package manager. Now, if you still want to be using some of the old input system just while you're busy migrating your project over to the new input system, you can come up to edit, project settings, and then go to the player tab, scroll down, until you see active input handling. As you can see, it's currently set to input system package, which is the new input system. If you click on that, you can change it back to use the old input system, or you can select both. I'm going to leave it on new, as I plan on only using the new input system going forward. So now we can go ahead and go to our project files, come to our scripts folder, player folder, and then let's create a new folder that we're just going to call input can go ahead and open that up. Now let's really talk a little bit about Unity's new input system. The new input system is a action-based system. In the documentation, they define action as a logical input such as jump or fire. That is an input action that a player can trigger through one or more input devices and then it runs a piece of game logic. So the idea is that we define actions, our code does things based off of those actions, and our input devices trigger those actions. And what makes this really cool is we can set up different key bindings for different devices that all trigger the same action. So it's easy to swap between keyboard and mouse and controller. So we'll get into that in just a second. So to start off with using the new input system, we have to create an input action asset. To do that in the input folder, just right click, go create, and it should be around the bottom of this list. Here is a input actions. Go ahead and click that and let's just call that player. We're calling it player because we're gonna use all of these input actions for our player. Go ahead and double click on that to open it up. And this opens up a little window where we can now define all of our actions. We can drag this uh, window and dock it wherever we want. So I'm just gonna dock it next to game. And now let's get started. So the first thing we need to do is create an action map. Now an action map is a collection of assets. So for example, let's create a new action map and I'm gonna call it gameplay, like that. My reasoning for calling it gameplay is because I can create another action map that I can, for instance, call dialogue. And so gameplay will hold all of my actions, for example, with regards to movement and fighting and my dialogue action map can hold all of the input associated with dialogue. So clicking enter to continue to the next line, etc. So now that we've created an action map, just to the right of it, you can see we have actions. When you create a new action map, it comes with a default new action. If you click on the action to the right, we can see the properties of said action. We first of all have the action type, which is currently set to button. And if we click the little drop down, you can see we have three different options, value, button, and pass through. So we use value when we want to track continuous changes in the state of a control. So for example, using WASD for movement input or the left stick on the controller. 
button we'll use more so when we want something to get triggered, so like clicking to attack. We'll get into using both of these in just a second. Our last option is pass through, which is very similar to value with some slight differences. We're not going to be using that today. You can go read the documentation if you want to understand more about what it is. So let's just go ahead and rename this action to movement. Like I said, for movement, the action type we're going to be using is value. So go ahead and set action type to value. And that gives us the option to set a control type. Click the drop down for control type and set it to vector two. So the value we're going to be passing through with this action is a vector two. We now need to go and define our bindings for this action. So what keys or controller input do we want to be linked to this action? So to do that under the action on this little plus sign to the right of it, click that and we can now add a binding. So first let's go ahead and add the keyboard bindings. And for that, we need to click add a 2D vector composite. So this is going to be one binding that has four different keys. This means it's going to build us a vector two based on these four different keys. Let's just go ahead and rename this binding to WASD. And now we can specify what key we want to be associated with up, down, left, and right. To do that, just click on the key. And then back in the properties, you now see we have an option for a path. The path is the input we want to use for this binding. So we can go ahead and click this drop down. And here we have all the different input types we can use. We can also go ahead and search for an input. But a handy little feature that we have is this listen button, we can now just use any of those keys and it'll pick up what key we're pushing. So currently we're looking at up. So let's press W. As you can see, we're getting two options W on the keyboard or any key on the keyboard, we want to choose w let's go ahead and do the same for down so listen s choose that one left is going to be a whoops and then right is d there we go and now we have our bindings set up for keyboard now let's also do one for controller if you have a controller i'm just going to go ahead and close up WASD. Now right above WASD, you can see that movement came with a default binding as well. So let's just go ahead and click on that. And then under path, listen, if you have your controller plugged in, you can again give the input. So I'm going to move my left stick. And you can see we again come up with two options. We have left stick gamepad and left stick Xbox controller. Now it's giving the Xbox controller option because that's what I'm using. But seeing as many gamepads are so similar, we can go ahead and choose the gamepad option. This guarantees that for any gamepad that we use, the leftmost stick will be associated with this action. There we go. And that's basically it. Let's go ahead and create a jump action as well while we're at it. So just go ahead and click the plus icon in actions. And let's call this action jump hit enter. Now for jump, we want the action type to be button because it's just we press the button and the character jumps. So we can just leave that as button. Let's go ahead and click on the binding and let's set the path to spacebar. Let's go ahead and add another binding. It's just a normal binding, go ahead and click on the path, listen, and this time I'm going to push the A button on my controller. As you can see, we again have two different options, we have button south and a Xbox controller. So seeing as a PlayStation controller does not have an A button, it has a different button at the bottom. I'm not quite sure which one it is. So if we choose button south, out of the four buttons, it'll guarantee that the southernmost, so the lowest button of the four is the one associated with this action. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on that one. And there we go. That's basically all set up. Now, another thing you want to make sure you do is click save if autosave is not ticked, but I recommend just ticking autosave. That way you don't lose any of your work. Now, the last thing we need to do in this window is set up control schemes. So control scheme allows you to define what input controllers you can use in your game. So up here at the left, you can see we currently have no control schemes. So if we click on that and say add control scheme, we can now create a new control scheme. Let's call the first one keyboard. And now we need to add what devices we want to be part of the keyboard control scheme. So hit the plus icon and choose keyboard and then hit the plus again and choose mouse. So now that means when we're in the keyboard control scheme, we want to use keyboard and mouse, go ahead and click save. And now let's go ahead and click on the drop down again and add another control scheme. Let's call this one gamepad. Now we can go ahead and add devices. So just say add to list, and we're just going to choose gamepad. As you can see, we can choose Xbox, PlayStation 4, Switch controllers, all of them, or we can just choose generic gamepad. Go ahead and click Save again. 
So now the last thing we need to do is just say which of these bindings for these different actions belong to which control scheme. So if we click on left stick over here, we can say, okay, this binding belongs to gamepad. We can then click on the drop down for WASD. And you have to do this for each one of the keys separately. So W belongs to keyboard, S belongs to keyboard, A belongs to keyboard, and D belongs to keyboard. As you can see, those bindings have now disappeared because we're currently looking at the gamepad control scheme. So let's go ahead and click on the space bar and set that to keyboard and button south to gamepad. So now if we change the control scheme between keyboard and gamepad, we only get those control scheme specific bindings. Okay, so that's everything we had to do in our player input actions asset. So we can go ahead and go back to our scene view. Doesn't really matter. Now we can take a look at how we actually use this in our code. So one thing to note is there is a whole bunch of different ways that you can implement this in your code. I'm going to show you guys the one that I found easiest to understand and the one that I'll be using until it no longer works. This also seems to be the recommended way of doing it. They just wanted to give us lots of flexibility. So like I said, we're going to be making our player from scratch. So instead of messing with our current player, let's just go ahead and disable him and let's create a new player game object. Make sure you reset your transforms. Okay, so now on our player game object, we want to go ahead and click add component. And we want to add the player input component. Just make sure you chose player input and not player input manager. That's a whole different thing. So now the first thing this player input needs is a actions asset or an input actions asset. That's the thing that we just created. So we can just go ahead and drag that in there. Next, we have our default scheme. So we can say, okay, by default, we want the game to run using keyboard or gamepad. Leaving it on any is fine. There's also an option here for auto switch, which means if it detects input from keyboard or input from controller, swap between the different control schemes. We can just leave that as it is as well. Default map, we can just leave as gameplay and the rest of the stuff doesn't really matter yet. The important thing now is our behavior. So how the input system works is when we give a certain input, the input system is going to trigger something to let us know, hey, you've got an input and here's the value of that input. So behavior is the method which the input system uses to let us know. By default, it's set to send messages, but we're going to change this to invoke unity events. So that means whenever we get input, it's going to invoke an event and we can tell those events to call a certain function. So that's what this events drop down here is. Over here, we have a list of different events. There are these three default events, which is device lost, device regained, and control changed event. Those aren't important right now. We'll get into those later in the series. But above all of this, we have gameplay. This is the action map that we created. If we click on the little drop down, you can see we have movement and jump are two different actions. So if we click the little plus sign over here, it allows us to drag in an object and then choose a function on that object to call when the event happens. This is how we subscribe to those events. So what we need now is a object with functions that we can call. So if you had a movement script with a move function, you could drag that script from your player into this slot over here and then choose your move function. Whenever you get input, it'll call that function, but there's a little bit more to it. We'll get into that in just a second. So in our input folder, let's just go ahead and create a new C -sharp script. I'm just going to call it player input handler. Seeing as moving forward, we're going to be working with a finite state machine for our player. We're going to have a whole separate script that's going to deal with just input. Go ahead and open that up. And let's just go ahead and delete all of this pre-generated code. So now what we need to do is write functions to assign to those events. So let's declare a public void. And the first one I'm going to call on move input. And the second one I'm going to call public void on jump input like that. Now an important thing that we need to add to these functions is as an input parameter, we need to take in a input action dot callback context. And this is just a data type defined by the new input system that allows the input to pass through important values. This is how we're going to get what value our vector two is and what value our jump trigger is. And by default, it seems the standard is to just call it context. 
So let's just go ahead and add that to our other function as well. And yeah, now we're ready to hook up the events. So let's go back to Unity and then click on our new player. And now we need to drag our player input handler onto the player as another component. We can then go ahead and open up our events again. And we have our movement event up here. So now we can just go ahead and drag this component from here into this slot. This will now allow us to choose a function from this script. So go ahead and click on the function dropdown, choose player input handler, and then choose on move input. For the jump event, we can go ahead and push the plus sign, drag in our player input handler again, go to functions, say player input handler, and on jump input. So now if we go back to code, just to demonstrate this, let's put a debug statement in each function just to show that they're getting cold. So now when the movement event gets called, this function should get called. And when the jump event gets called, this function should get called. So let's go back to Unity and let's test that. Okay, so I'm getting an error just because I need to disable this player after image pool as well. So after disabling the player after image pool game object, let's go ahead and run the game. If we go to console, if I push W, A, S, or D, all of these calls move input to get printed to the console. If I push spacebar, we get jump input. If I pick up my controller and start moving the left stick, you can see we have move input. And if I push A, I get jump input. Perfect. Okay, so let's go back to our script. And now let's talk about this context variable that we have. So there's four important pieces of information that we can get from context. Context allows us to get the value of the input. Like I said, that is if we want to get the specific vector two from our movement input or whether our jump input is true or false. And then it also has a phase. So what the phase allows us to do is find out when the input was started, when was it performed, and when was it cancelled. This is the new input system's equivalent of input.getButton down, input.getButton, and input.getButtonUp. So let's quickly go ahead and demonstrate that. Let's just go ahead and create a new private vector 2. And I'm just going to call it movement input. Now in on move input. Let's go ahead and get rid of the debug statement. And let's just say movement input equals context dot read value. Then for read value, we need to specify the type of value that we're reading. In this case, it is a vector two, like that. So that should now store our input vector two in movement input. Let's just go ahead and debug that vector two. Now in jump input, Let's just go ahead and say if context dot started, then debug dot log. So if context dot started, we're going to log that the jump button has just been pushed down. As you'll see, this will only be printed out once the instant we push down the button. Next, let's say if context dot performed, then we'll debug jump is being held down. And then finally, if context dot canceled, debug dot log, jump button has been released. And then we can just go ahead and get rid of this debug statement. So if we save this and go back to Unity and then run the game, you'll see nothing is popping up. Once we start giving movement input, I'm just gonna use my controller. You can see it starts printing out a vector two. So it's currently zero, zero because the stick is not doing anything. If I move the stick all the way to the left, you can see it starts printing out negative one and 0 0.1. The 0 0.1 is there because the stick is slightly upwards. If I roll the stick around, you can see the vector two changing. If I swap over to keyboard and mouse and I hold A, you see we have negative one, zero. If I hold down A and W, we have negative 0.7 and 
So you can see the input system takes care of normalizing the vector for us, which is pretty cool. Now let's look at the jump input. I'm just gonna go ahead and clear the console. Now if I push down spacebar, make sure you click on the game tab. If you push down spacebar, as you can see, jump button, push down now, and then jump button is being held down. Now, if I let go of spacebar, jump button has been released. Now, an interesting thing to note about this is that context.started and context.performed is essentially the same thing. The difference is context.started is set to true and then immediately set to false within the same frame. So you're only going to use this in an if statement like this, where you want to do something the instant the button gets pushed down. And as you can see, if we go back to Unity, if we look at the log, jump button is being held down is only printed once, meaning this Unity event it only gets invoked when the input changes. It doesn't continuously invoke while the input is being given. But with this context information, it's enough for us to do what we need to do. There's no need for us to continuously invoke an event for a button the way we do with our movement input. So just to give an example in the code, I would have something like this, where if context got started, in the case of the jump input, here I will apply the jump velocity. And then if I have my variable jump height multiplier that I have in the other code, which only happens if I let go of the jump button, I will have that code here in context.canceled. So yeah, that should get you started with the new input system. Of course, you can just write these functions in your normal script if you have a simpler controller, but we're gonna be moving on to a finite state machine, as I've said, which is going to be a little bit more complicated on our input handler side, but it's gonna be a lot of fun and we'll get started creating the finite state machine in the next episode. I hope I've managed to enlighten you on the new input system so far and uh, managed to show you how cool it is with the ability to change between different devices so easily without having to do anything extra in the code. And like I said, this is just a quick start guide. There isn't really that much information on the input system itself. If you guys would like a dedicated input system video, please let me know if there's enough support for that. I might dive a little bit deeper into it. But of course, first, there's more I need to learn about it. So yeah, let me know. So yeah, that's it for the introduction to the finite state machine player controller. We'll get into the meat of the finite state machine in the next episode. And I would just like to thank all of my supporters and wonderful people on Patreon. And a huge special thank you to Triac, Cody Lee, Pyro Says, and Miguel for your supports on Patreon. It really means a lot to me. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.